This uh, John Fromentiel Walnut Clock was made in about 1670 and it's got lots of very interesting features hidden away. First of all, it's in walnut, whereas everything else prior to this was in the Puritan tradition of black, black ebony. And virtually, well, I think every one of his father's clocks from Ahasuerus was in black ebony. And John is making a difference. He's pointing out that this is an innovation, it's new. You can see it across the room. Goodness me, I've never seen a walnut clock before. No, that's interesting. That's what he was trying to do. It's like Apple bringing out a white iPhone when everybody else was black. You could see it across the room. Oh, what's he got? Oh, I have one of those. That's it. So the clock retains all the features of the black ebony. The columns have entasis as they go up. The beautiful single piece castings are incredibly detailed in the Corinthian details. Um, nice bases and the beautiful spandrels. The detail in, in the Corinthian capitals and the spandrels, they're really first class, beautiful objects. And it just sets everything off, the detail of the architectural case, even with the rain drip on the top of the cornice here. Yes, it's a traditional architectural case, but it's not in ebony. On the dial plate is the lovely signature of flowing Johannes Fromentiel, Londini fake it. John Fromentiel of London made it. In the junction of the hood to the trunk here, you've got these convex mouldings, which shows it's a really early case. And then the walnut here, see its reflection split down the middle of the panel and surrounded by beading. Later, this was all made cross grain, so you can see that this straight grain beading um, is very, very early. And so that the, it got even more sophisticated uh, when the cabinet makers started making these cross grain. But at the moment, it was just straight grain and still looks very lovely, doesn't it? And the, the mechanism um, is also very different. And the, the thing to look at is the spacing here of the two winding holes. See, they're quite close together, far closer together than you'll see virtually any other clock. Because John's changed the layout of the mechanisms inside. And whereas normally all standard layouts has the great wheel both at the back, when they're both at the back, they take up a lot of room. Whereas if you put them one at the front and one at the back, you can overlap the great wheels and use smaller plates. Why do you want to use smaller plates? Less expensive. None of the innovations is that John has fitted the count wheel straight onto the great wheel. He's cut the uh, count wheel out of a sheet of brass and then it's been riveted on. And that's a big saving from having a separate arbor to mount the count wheel on up the back of the clock here. So, so now the count wheel is on to the great wheel. The great wheel is part of the barrel and the barrel has 16 turns and the clock mechanism goes round once every 12 hours which brings the count wheel round with it. So that it's more reliable, um, it's easier to make, it's a win-win development. There's a lot of thought gone into the escape wheel mechanism. First of all, the arbor 
for the pallets is square. It's a, a simple way of locking the pallets, which are often just brazed in with uh, a round hole on a round arbor by locking them onto a square arbor. And then the two pallets are longer than usual. And you can see the slot in the back plate to let them in and out so that uh, John could disassemble and play with the angles and uh, get it exactly right without taking the whole mechanism apart. And so that the two pallets are long. It's ceasing to look like an anchor and it's got these two long pallets coming down. And you can see the recoil, the recoil backwards and the recoil forwards for each swing of the, the pendulum. The mechanism is actually being driven backwards by the swing of the pendulum. It's just about coming up towards two o'clock. In any moment now, uh, the clock will strike. It's got a lovely slow strike. Uh, not bing bing, but it's nice and gentle, not too loud. Just what you'd want in your, uh, your house. You could hear it go, and yet, it didn't stop the conversation. It was just in the background. Isn't that lovely? So the strike chain is very much simplified because you can see the pinwheel here, which actually operates the, the bell hammer. And each of these pins, as it revolves, gives one stroke of the bell. The, the rest of the train going up through these gears just drives the fly. And that controls the speed of the operation of the, the bell. And it's got the fly mounted outside the back of the back plate. It's spring-loaded on with a, a butterfly spring so that when the locking lever drops in, then uh, there's no great strain on the system that the, the fly, even though it's a big heavy uh, item, can slip round on its own arbor. And a heavy fly, um, it needs energy to accelerate it, and then it's much a, a stable uh, air damper to give the striking timing um, to be nice and slow and so we can trip it again by lifting the locking lever here which has got the extension which comes down onto the uh, count wheel here and then it will go on again and strike. So we lift it Isn't that beautiful?